Hey, spooky art appreciators. I'm Suzanne, and this is my daughter, Emily. I'm an illustrator, and Emily is a fine artist. We love spooky stories from the art world and are on a quest to find them and share them with you. If you know of any, we'd love to hear from you at whisperingcontact at gmail.com, or you can direct message us on Instagram at Whispering Gallery Podcast. So we have some show news. Thanks for sticking with us as we finally learned how to say Tavernier with the Hope Diamond and our very non-French mispronunciations. Also, this show references creepypasta, which according to Urban Dictionary is online stories that will haunt the things that haunt you. Things you read during the day thinking, this will be fun, then wishing you hadn't when night comes around. The third definition on Urban Dictionary states creepy pastas are disturbing ghost or horror stories in general that lurk through the interwebs. So in this episode, we're talking about haunted art. And as we've peeled back the surface on the subject, it becomes clear that some of the stories aren't quite really haunted, but rather cursed, and some have more facts backing them up than others. Is this a case of the Uncanny Valley phenomenon or something darker? For those unfamiliar with the Uncanny Valley, it's generally thought of to be a computer-generated figure or humanoid robot bearing a near-identical resemblance to a human being that arouses a sense of unease or revulsion in the person viewing it. In art, this can relate to a figure that has been rendered very similarly. It's just close enough to being human, but still far away enough to scare you and tell your mind that something is wrong. That definition for the Uncanny Valley was from Google's dictionary, but the art is something that I've just learned through my, my history classes with my professors. Okay, cool. I will start off with a, I guess, a personal story from when I was a kid, and I had to practice the piano before going to school every morning for an hour. So we'd get up super early. Besides being blurry and hardly awake, there was a creepy picture behind me. <laughs> so, <laughs> and Emily's seen it at her grandmother's house. I wasn't super great at the piano, but I would practice for an hour. One of my art teachers had told everybody that as we, we build our, our drawings to be very careful at first so that we don't draw carelessly. And then you end up doing all this work later. And he said, don't polish a turd. So I know that's a little gross, but when I wasn't really into playing the piano and I was just going through the motions, kind of fits that realm because I wasn't paying attention to what I was doing. Mm -hmm. So. I would get up and I would haul a blanket out to the piano with me and I'd be wrapped up in a blanket. With the little time I memorized my exercises that I would warm up with and play mindlessly for about 15 minutes and I could get away with it. I could do chords <laughs> and scales. <laughs> the only thing exercises. you can get away with with grandma. Yeah, so it had to be kind of legit, but she'd let me go for about 15 minutes. As I woke up, I would start to play some of the other pieces a lot of sonatas and sonatinas towards the end. And right behind me on the opposite wall, this photograph, Aunt Tilly. And that wasn't the name of it. It was the woman behind a screen by Ansel Adams. Her eyes were on me all morning when I was alone in the living room in the dark. <laughs> Tug, it's pretty dark in the, in the winter. Mm -hmm. This lady, as my mom has had me look at the photograph over again, I'm sure she's just had a rough time of things. She's behind the screen and looks tired, and she's older, and I'm like, you know, cut her a break. <laughs> so I, I get that now, but when I was little, there was this lady staring at me that was just a black and white photo, and it was just very creepy. I could feel it on my back. Well, and she has such an intense gaze, too. It's really focused. Oh, yeah, totally. With this episode being based on art pieces, we'll be linking out to them so we can link to this one as well so you can see what we're talking about. I know this is a photograph and not a painting, but this could be just an accidental thing that my mom hung it up behind the piano, or maybe mm -hmm. she could have planned it out. Who knows? I was not a fan. 
and I still don't think I would hang the picture in my home, but that's my own hangups. Um, <laughs> so I have studied Ansel Adams a little more in photography class in college, and this stuff's pretty amazing. And I, I think my dad was an amateur photographer and worked on black and white photography, playing with light and shadow and composition quite a bit. So I can see why my parents would have been drawn to a piece done by Ansel Adams. So are these paintings haunted or cursed? To determine that for yourself, I don't think we're going to be telling you how you should feel about these, but we're going to give you the definitions so that you can find out for yourself where these pieces fall for you. So haunted uh, means often visited by ghosts um, or the spirits of dead people. A haunted house is an example. It also can be another interpretation of that, which is showing signs of worry or anxiety. An example of that would be haunted eyes. So a curse is an adjective as well as haunted is an adjective. And cursed means experiencing problems and unhappiness. An example of this would be experiencing bad luck caused by a magic curse. And those definitions are from the Cambridge Dictionary. I found another definition of haunted to share from dictionary.com. Haunted, again an adjective, it's inhabited or frequented by ghosts, as in a haunted castle, or preoccupied, as with an emotion, memory, or idea, obsessed. His haunted imagination gave him no peace. It could also be disturbed, distressed, worried, haunted by doubt. He again turned to law books on the subject. That came again from dictionary.com. It seems they're two different things. It seems like haunting has more to do with spirits and maybe more of like the possession realm uh, yeah. of like a piece being possessed by a, a ghost or being inhabited by a ghost. And then a curse seems to be more an object that has like bad wishes placed on it. I, I don't There's know. Some sort of magic involved or, mm -hmm. or a part of its story. What we're going to be covering in this episode, we're going to be talking about the painting The Hands Resist Him, The Crying Boy, Dorian Gray, which is a book by Oscar Wilde, but also there's a painting associated with the movie, The Rain Woman, The Anguished Man. Then we're going to be talking about the lack of factual evidence that's focused around these paintings. We'll talk about the uncanny valley and also eyes watching you from the portraits so that seem to follow you around. To get started, we'll talk to you about the hands that resist him. One thing about online articles about these cursed pieces is that there can be things like warnings or things to make it seem like, oh, you've looked at this picture too long, there might be a curse upon it, and you might be affected because you looked at it too long. And it's just kind of those things that nobody could measure or really, you know, just to creep you out by the possibility that your imagination could run with. It's like those chain emails where it's like, if you don't forward this to 15 people, you're going to die in the next seven days. Yeah, that's exactly. Mm -hmm. So you send it to all these people. Yeah. <laughs> and then they're like, why are you emailing me? Off of Mysterious Universe, there's an article. It's called Mysterious, Cursed, and Haunted Paintings of the World by Brent Swanker, or Swanser, as of August 25th of 2015. He talks about The Hands Resist Him, which is a painting by Bill Stoneham. He states that it's sometimes billed as the most haunted painting in the world. When the artist was living in California with his wife, they were asked to do two works of art a month for gallery owner Charles Weingarten. He had a deadline coming up and decided to create a work based on an old photo of himself when he was five, entitled after a poignant poem his wife had written for him about how he had been adopted and never known his biological parents. The result was an image depicting a young boy and a decidedly creepy-looking dead-eyed female doll standing in front of a glass-paneled door against which numerous spectral hands press out from the darkness beyond the glass. According to Stoneham, the boy is himself at age five. The doorway represents a barrier between the waking world and the dream world, 
and the doll is one who will guide him through the doorway into the world of fantasy. As for the hands, the artist cryptically said, the hands were all of the possibilities. You were left with the question, are these disembodied hands? Are they dismembered? Floating in space? Or are they connected to bodies? Over time, the painting went on to be displayed at that gallery. It was purchased by an actor, and after one year of coming into contact with the painting, three people had died. The art critic, Seldes, the gallery owner, Feingarten, and the actor who had first purchased it, Marley. The painting sort of disappeared and was forgotten about until 2000, when an elderly couple found it left abandoned behind a California brewery that had been turned into an art space. The couple decided to put it up on eBay for sale. They wrote kind of a, a I don't know, kind of creepy pasta ish because it's, well, I, I don't know, maybe I'm using this wrong, has errors in the spelling, all caps. I don't know it's, if that's high drama or bad internet usage. Or... Yeah, it kind of seems like a lot of this stuff is seemingly done to just make it as creepy as possible. Yeah, for sure. Warning, do not bid on this painting if you are susceptible to stress-related disease, faint of heart, or are unfamiliar with supernatural events. By bidding on this painting, you agree to release the owners of all liability in relation to the sale or any events happening after the sale that might be contributed to this painting. This painting may or may not possess supernatural powers that could impact or change your life. It seems a little dramatic. Yeah, it's a little much, but I mean... The salesmanship, though. <laughs> yeah, that's like, whoa. If somebody you know, wants to track it and research it or whatever, it's spooky, though. There were some pictures taken by the couple that came with that advertisement that goes on, and I will link to this article. They said not to use this as a computer background, etc. The couple set up a motion-triggered camera after they had noticed some strange things. Their daughter had said, in quoting from the ad, one morning, our four-and-a-half-year-old daughter claimed that the children in the picture were fighting and coming into the room during the night. Now, I don't believe in UFOs or Elvis being alive, but my husband was alarmed. To my amusement, he set up a motion-triggered camera for the nights. After three nights, there were pictures. The last two pictures shown are from that stakeout. After seeing the boy seemingly exiting the painting under threat, we decided the painting has to go. Please judge for yourself. Before you do, please read the following warning and disclaimer. So, again, very dramatic. And there's a picture in this article, too, of the doll and the supposed gun. It was purchased for $1,025 and is now owned by Kim Smith of Perception Gallery in Grand Rapids, Michigan. It's had a few viewings. Quoting from the article, the gallery even approached the artist of the piece himself to ask about his thoughts on the matter, to whether he responded with surprise and claimed that the gun in the painting wasn't even a gun at all, but rather merely a dry cell battery and a tangle of wires. Currently, the hands resist him is kept in storage at Smith's gallery and has only been taken out for viewing six times. With the painting stirring up feelings of unease and dread every time, Another quote, the artist who has been deluged with mail asking him about the original haunted painting has gone on to say, we live in an age of science of revelation and hard realities and hard facts, but we are still drawn to the mysterious. And what is more mysterious than paintings? More than any other object, paintings are a one of a kind thing created by someone using their hands. The hands that resist him seems like a somewhat disturbing painting anyway when you look at it with the doll and the, the young boy and the hands in the window. So you already have something that might raise unease. Then add the stories behind it and the family that had the, the motion capture video. There's enough there of a story to creep us out, like with the creepy pasta. When maybe you think about it later, could such a thing happen? Could... Of course not, but then you're still like, hmm, that's really, I don't know, and you're, you're left with unease. That's the first painting we looked at.
Okay, so now we're on to The Crying Boy. Most of the information for this came from uh, Creepypasta and also Galerix.org. Let's go ahead and dive into this. So The Crying Boy was painted by Bruno Amadio. He was also known as Bragaulin, also known as Franchot Seville, also known as Angelo Bragaulin, and also known as Giovanni Bragaulin. Quite a few aliases. The Crying Boy is actually a group of paintings called The Crying Boys. So there are about 65 paintings that were made under the name uh, Bragaulin, and reproductions of these works were sold worldwide. There are claims that these paintings subjects were from a local orphanage in Spain, which burned down. However, I couldn't find any sort of substantiation, any sort of uh, record or any, I don't know, any sort of factual evidence associated with this. That seems to be the theory, though, because these paintings have been associated with at least five house fires, according to the sources that I was able to find. Artists named this series The Gypsy Cycle which is kind of odd because the work doesn't seem to depict any Romani people or have any ties to the Romani. It's really just crying children in this series. It's just kind of interesting that he would name it that. I don't know, just kind of a a weird aside. So the only real piece of evidence that I was able to find with this was from The Sun, which is a British newspaper. It stated that May and Ron Halov of Rotherhams had their home burned to the ground after purchasing one of these crying boy pieces. Oh, and also the victims of these house fires claimed that the portraits weren't able to burn and that they didn't burn in the house fires and that they also weren't able to burn the portraits themselves. It sounds more like a curse, like somebody's house is burning down after they've purchased the painting and then the painting isn't touched, but everything around it has been destroyed. For sure, yeah. And that seems to tie in with the claim that the subjects are from the orphanage, because if this is happening, then the orphans who were the subjects of the painting were involved in a fire, their orphanage burned down. Mm -hmm. So it would tie in with kind of the curse that seems to be involved with these pieces. So for sure. Okay. Some pieces involved in the fires uh, were copies by Anna Zinhasen, um, not reproductions of Giovanni's. So one last thought on the Crying Boy series is from uh, Galerix.org. So it stated, um, it is still unknown why the children of the canvases cry. The most common version is that the author specifically frightened them, brought them to horror, and then painted The faces of the children of an ordinary person led to horror. Wide open eyes full of fear, resentment, despair, misunderstanding. The heart breaks looking at them, and it is possible that the picture after its completion retained this energy, and through her already small sitters took revenge on those who hung their images at home. That's kind of creepy, and that that idea of painting energy into the final work doesn't Mm -hmm. sound like any of these that we're talking about are prints. They're actual art pieces. Yeah. That segue is really well into the uh, story of The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde. The plot of The Picture of Dorian Gray is the subject of a full-length portrait in oil by Basil Hallward, an artist impressed and infatuated by Dorian's beauty. He believes that Dorian's beauty is responsible for the new mood in his art as a painter. Through Basil, Dorian meets Lord Henry Wotton, and he is he soon is enthralled by the aristocrat's hedonistic worldview that beauty and sensual fulfillment are the only things worth pursuing in life. Newly understanding that his beauty will fade, Dorian expresses the desire to sell his soul to ensure that the picture rather than he will age and fade. The wish is granted and Dorian pursues the libertine life of varied immoral experiences while staying young and beautiful. All the while his portrait ages and records every sin. That is right off the picture of Dorian Gray on Wikipedia. So that Lord Henry Wotton, I don't know if you got to that point, M, but I really got lost in the flowery words of that he was saying to, to Dorian. It seemed he was talking up, like they say, a certain lifestyle. Dorian's all in, you know, hook, line, and sinker. It just seemed kind of cheesy. Basil is Dorian's friend to begin with, and he's trying to protect Dorian. It's a little weird how infatuated Basil is in being able to preserve the art, you know, the the beauty he sees in his model. And so it's just a little weird. And Basil asked his friend, that's a little itching. 
She sounds like Thumper when she does. Dorian Gray appears in The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. I don't know if you remember him. I think you and I and my husband Taz are the only ones in the world who like that movie. Everybody else <laughs> seems to be super down on it. I'm like, but, but they have everybody in there. Yeah. <laughs> so that was kind of cool. Anyway, spoiler alert for, for that story. If you were planning to read it, skip ahead a few seconds. From what I understand, Dorian stabs the painting in the end, so he's able to, to die. And so he was granted his wish of eternal youth. I don't know who granted that to him. Maybe I should have read longer. The book is, it's a hard read, though. I mean, I wasn't able to finish it um, just, you know, since we do this podcast on the side and um, with work and life and everything. It's its a hard book to get through. The flowery diatribes would kind of lose me with Between Basil talking about what the fabulous model is and Lord Henry telling him what life can be and what he should be going after. So the anguished man, um, the artist is unknown, and I wasn't able to find any sort of proof involving this story. So a little bit of background before I go into this this painting. It was found by uh, Sean Robinson, who is now the owner of the piece, as well as the writer of The Anguished Man. And he claims that he inherited this piece from his grandmother, who said that she had had it for about 25 years, just hidden in the attic, because she thought that it was evil. And she said that there was a dark figure attached to it, as well as hearing strange and eerie noises coming from the piece. That's just a little bit of background on Sean Robinson. So it seems a little weird. He has a YouTube channel where he kind of documents the the painting, I guess, or trying to document the phenomenon. It seems like he's kind of building a creepypasta type of legend around it. Like he's kind of DIYing um, his own yeah. legend. I don't know, it just seems a little weird, but it looks like he's got a lot of followers. Um, when I did look up his videos, I just haven't watched them, um, mm-hmm. but it does look like he has quite a few followers. But yeah, so the reason why the anguished man is thought to be um, haunted or, or cursed is that the artist mixed their blood into the oil paint while they were creating this piece, and uh, they also committed suicide soon after completing the piece. So again, no proof of this. I didn't see if the painting was examined for blood. I didn't see, you know, any sort of linking of an artist to this painting to see if, you know, you could find death records or anything like that. So it's just kind of a really creepy story. Urban legend. Yeah. The painting seems to represent the last thoughts of an artist in turmoil when based on the interpretation from Sean Robinson, as far as the creation of the piece, as well as the the kind of haunting side of it with the dark figure and the noises that are coming from it. Might I just add the noises to me sound really creepy. I mean, I I haven't heard them. I'm just saying the idea of noises coming out of a painting. Yeah. Yeah, That was, it just seems like such a nope fish, just so scary. So all of that being said, many people believe this to be a hoax. So like I said, Sean Robinson has a YouTube channel, which has led to gaining followers and has created a lot of interest in this piece. And Anguished is a horror movie that's in development, which is telling the story of how Sean acquired the piece and basically just the the origin story of the piece, I believe. It's still in development, but it does have an entry on IMDb. This piece also seems to have influenced the movie Velvet Buzzsaw, starring uh, Jake Gyllenhaal. This painting really seems to have influenced um, pop culture surrounding art. On Board Panda, there's an article on these frightening paintings hide horrible incidents that they caused. Giedre Vaisiolitite on Board Panda staff. They cover a lot of paintings that are pretty creepy in this article, and we will link to it. And we wanted to talk about The Rain Woman by Svetlana Pellet. What they say on this article is that the painter revealed that she finished the picture in about five hours, 
all the while feeling like her hand was guided by someone else. And everyone who has owned the painting reportedly would return it complaining of insomnia, feelings of sadness, and being watched. So that's just kind of a, a strange one, a spooky looking painting, and it's clouds and rain, but it's also just kind of interesting. Not horrific, just maybe mo moody more than anything. Mm -hmm. We'll link to that so you can see it. Next, we wanted to cover the lack of factual evidence in all of these stories. So it just seems like these stories are mainly urban legends, like the idea of haunted art really fascinates people, but there really doesn't seem to be a lot of claims that are able to be substantiated or any sort of evidence related to these claims. It does seem that people are researching and trying to link more evidence as far as in the Hands Resist Him, uh, how they had a motion capture camera to try to, to capture evidence, and in The Anguished Man, how Sean Robinson has the YouTube channel. So if these things are truly happening, it does seem like people are making an effort to capture any sort of haunting or any sort of supernatural events that occur. But at the same time, you know, there's no documentation that I could find, no death records, no names linked to anyone besides the one couple that I found in the sun who were affected by the crying boy. So it just kind of seems a little, I, I don't know, I was hoping for more factual evidence. I was hoping for a little bit more than just a spooky story. You know, spooky stories are great, but at the same time, it's also nice to have it pan out and come through, you know? Um, some facts supporting it, yeah. Definitely, you know, like it seems commonplace in a haunting to, you know, be able to find a death record and know who's haunting or what's yeah. going on with that, being able to find land records or anything like that. But it seems like those are definitely missing from this type of a subject, I guess. There's maybe a lot of environmental and circumstantial, like the motion capture. Photoshop can do so much anymore. I mean, I always said it could do so much. So it's kind of like somebody could have photoshopped the doll and put a red filter on it. The Dorian Gray, of course, is a work of fiction, and the Rain Woman, it, there wasn't a whole lot of information I found on her. It was more mood that was affected. Mm -hmm. so, I was surprised with The Crying Boy. I mean, there was a claim from multiple sources that five houses were burned down due to The Crying Boy, or due to owning The Crying Boy, or series within that work. But yeah, it just seems, you know, if, if five houses were burned down due to this painting, it would seem that there would be more, I don't know, more names, more, you know, where were these houses located? What day? Yeah. There yeah. are records for this. I know there are, you know, but I wasn't able to find them. So I don't know. The one that I did find was in England. So uh, maybe it's just a little more obscure. I, I don't know. So there's some information, but mixed with a lot of... It seems like myth and just kind yeah. of stories that have been built up around these. Yeah. Jeepers, creepers, where'd you get those peepers? Jeepers, creepers, where'd you get those eyes? We wanted to cover, this isn't maybe haunted, but I guess what else would it be if there's eyes in a portrait that are following you? Mm -hmm. We've all heard of it. We've all probably seen it in like cheesy B movies, you know, like scary films and the portrait eyes follow you across the room or follow the person across the room. Or the haunted um, mansion. <laughs> Yeah, the little the statues that follow you as you walk through the line. Oh yeah, the holograms of the statues mm -hmm. at Disneyland. In some, or in books and stories, movies, the eyes are. I think it's Murder by Death. In that movie, they have somebody watching all of them through a painting, and you see the actual painting area of the eyes move, and then you see human eyes, and then you see it slid back, and it's gone. This seems to have come about with perception and light and shadow in art. This is a quote from How Stuff Works. It was an article, Why Do the Eyes in Paintings Seem to Follow You Sometimes? by Josh Clark. So how does it work? Essentially, what is going on is that the light, shadow, and perspective depicted in a painting are fixed, meaning they don't shift. Remember when your friend stared forward and you walked from side to side? His or her eyes didn't follow you because the light and shadow, as well as perspective you see, actually change. Features that were close to you as you stood on one side are farther away when you stand on the other side. Since the elements of perspective and light and shadow are fixed in a painting and don't change, they look pretty much the same no matter from what angle you look at it. 
This is sourced from Guardian, and I will link to this area that I'm quoting from so you can click and, and go see the reference he made. So if a person is painted to look at you, he or she will continue to look as you move about the room. If a person is painted looking away from you, the light, shadow, and perspective shouldn't allow him or her to ever look at you. Even if you move yourself to the point where the person has been painted looking toward. And this was from Why Do Eyes in Paintings Seem to Follow You Sometimes by Josh Clark. So now that we've taken a deeper look into these dark works of art, do you think they are haunted or cursed? Or are these paintings urban legends that have gone off the rails? Think on it and DM us or comment on Instagram. If you have the time and are so inclined, please leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts. It will help our show out and help other people that are looking for podcasts see if they want to give it the time of day. We love sharing these interesting stories with more friends and listeners and artists who enjoy these stories as much as we do. Thank you so much for your interest as we delve into the mysteries of the art world. If you know of any spooky or haunted art, please DM us on Instagram at Whispering Gallery Podcast. We'll talk to you in a couple of weeks with a new episode. Take care. See you later. Thank you.